Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cuisines of Mitigation, Tastes of Home from Far Away. Um, I'm April Hemis. I'm a soybean, U.S. soybean farmer from Iowa. I really think it's warmer at home than it is here, which is strange for me to say. Uh, we're getting a beautiful rain at home, I hear, so I'm really happy to to report that because we need rain bad. But um, we, I'm here to talk about soybeans and um, let you know how hard we soybean farmers work in the U.S. to bring you an abundant, high-quality crop. Um, please stop by the booth. I'll be there. Ask a soybean farmer. I love to talk about what I do and, more importantly, why I do it, why I raise the crops the way I do. Um, it's, a fun, it's just fun. I farm my family century farm. So um, they make me follow these. I kind of don't like, I kind of go off script sometimes. So. I have to say these things. So anyway, um, we're here. Um, U.S. Soy is the so is the oil sponsor this year. Um, we have provided over a thousand pounds of high leg soybean oil, so all participants can um, have some. Um, have the opportunity to test and try out our oil. If you're interested in receiving a sample, please stop by. Talk to me, but more importantly, talk to Joy over here, um, and we can get you a sample and connect at the marketplace table for soy. Um, we also, uh, let's see, oh, we provide, so the, here's one of the presenters. So they were talking about locally raised and everything like that. So um, uh, the soybean farmers were happy to um, present or to uh, provide also not only the high lake soybean oil, but some the shortening too, yeah. So um, and it and others include highly functioning soybean oil shortenings and soy-based plant proteins. So now that I've gone enough off script, <laughs> I would love to introduce today our chef Zoe Anjonia. Okay, Anjonia. I knew I was going. <laughs> Sorry, Zoe, founder of Zoe's Ghana Kitchen Limited. And chefs David and I like to say Precious, but her name's Patience. Uh, Zoe and Patience came in um, from the CIA Hyde Park, New York campus. Um, the recipe today they're sharing is called Bitter Balls or Braised African Eggplant, cooked in high lake soybean oil. Bitter Balls are a small white eggplant that are picked immaturely and canned in a brine. You'll hear more from the chefs and They'll talk about that. I was gonna say, I'm supposed to say I'm moderator, but I guess that's me. But you're trying to hear more from me. Um, so I can't not wait to hear about the history of how this all came about and more about the taste. So take it away, chefs. Good morning. Oh, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing today? Good, good. So I'm, uh, I'm Dave Kamen. I'm the director of consulting at the Colony Institute of America Hyde Park campus. Uh, and I'm joined today by my lovely wife, uh, Patience Kamen, who's a culinary demonstrator at the Hyde Park campus in New York. And we're actually going to make two dishes for you today. We have the, uh, the African bitter eggplant, also known as tobogi. Uh, and then we also are going to do a demo on the, uh, on the chicken and potato green stew uh, that we had yesterday in the marketplace. Uh, so if you've been enjoying the, the products that we've been making in the marketplace uh, lately, I need, to, I need to say that it's all her. Uh, because while, while I'm a chef, she's a pastry chef, but she's also one of the best cooks I've ever met, and, and I could never have made all this food taste as good as she's making it taste here. So, uh, so thank you very much for that. I also want to say uh, a big thank you to, uh, to April and Joy and Vicki uh, and everybody at, uh, at the Soybean Board and at Smith Buckland and, uh, and everybody at MSL for sponsoring today. Uh, again, it was a, a big sponsor. Uh, gift just to get here, plus another thousand pounds of of high soybean oil and soybean oil shortening uh, for us to use, not just for us to use, but for all of the chefs that were contributing to the event this week to use. Uh, and again, we really appreciate your support, and and we're, we uh, we're happy with our collaboration. So uh, the dishes that we're going to make today, uh, actually, let me back up and 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 say that one of the things that we do at CIA Consulting is we help to operationalize thought leadership. So if any of y'all are sitting there uh, at the end of the conference and you're saying to yourself, wow, that was a really cool conference. We learned some really fun things. Now what? Uh, we're kind of the now what team. So at CIA Consulting, what we do is we provide a lot of training solutions. Uh, we pro provide a lot of menu and recipe support so that if you're thinking about how do I take this back to my 
operation, whatever it is, and how do I implement some of these wonderful world flavors or some of these new techniques or new dishes, uh, one of the things that you can do is you can, you can call us up and we can certainly help you with that. So uh, I apologize for that last 15 seconds of shameless self-promotion, but I had to make sure I throw that out there. Uh, because really the, the, the name of our, our game today is Cuisines of Migration and really how these dishes have maybe changed a little bit over the course of, uh, of time and over the course of distance. So again, the two dishes that we're making today um, are uh, definitely a little bit different than the ones that you might see from actually back home. So the first one that we're making here uh, is the, uh, is the chicken. What we'll do is we'll talk about the chicken here first because oh. we got that one open, right? So the chicken here, uh, so it's billed as, uh, as a chicken and potato green stew. Uh, and we've been kind of calling it that at the marketplace yesterday. I, 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 I kind of let the secret go to a few people that we're actually using spinach today. Um, traditionally, this would be done with the greens of a very specific potato plant. It's a white sweet yam that's grown in, in and around Liberia and Western Africa. And of course, uh, they are as industrious as they are, not just to pick the potatoes and use the tubers, but actually also to take the greens, clean them, cut them, and stew them, cook them down for quite some time, and turn that into something really, really delicious. Well, obviously, we don't have access to those uh, potato greens here. Uh, we actually tried for some water spinach, uh, but we weren't able to secure that as well. So we kind of settled with just some regular, plain old cello baby spinach. Uh, but as, uh, again, if you've tasted it yesterday, you uh, can tell that it's just as delicious a dish here. So we took that spinach and we kind of ground it up and then we're using the technique that would be used back home. Uh, and this is really what it comes down to. There are certain techniques, there are certain approaches to cooking uh, that we can use, but maybe we don't have the exact ingredient, the exact spice, the exact meat or, or, or vegetable item. And that's our opportunity then to kind of throw in something else. And that's really how we, we kind of contemporize the dish. So today we have the chicken. We're going to go ahead and, uh, and sear off that chicken in a, in a pretty decent amount of high oleic soybean oil here. Uh, and then we're going to essentially build the sauce from there. We have some onions, some garlic, some habanero peppers. Uh, we have the spinach that we're going to add inside there. Uh, and then it's just a matter of covering that up and letting that just, uh, just cook and stew. And, and the key here, uh, the two big keys here are a lot of love and a lot of time. Uh, time the clock, not time the herb. Um, because it just needs its, its opportunity to kind of cook down a little bit. Um, in the next pot over, if you want to pop that open real quick, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the pork uh, and eggplant stew. And this one starts a little bit differently. The pork and eggplant stew were actually steaming or sweating inside the pot there. So again, we've got some pork shoulder cubes, which we've been seasoning uh, for the last couple of days. Both the chicken and the pork uh, have been well seasoned. Uh, we actually put them up on, uh, on Tuesday. And is she here? OK, great. She's on the call. Oh, OK, I didn't realize. Hey, everybody, I guess uh, I didn't realize this, but we have Therese Nilsson, who is on, uh, joining us via Zoom today. Uh, I apologize, Therese, I didn't realize you were there. Everybody say hi. Hi, Teresa. Hey, everybody. Um, no, I don't want to throw this by you off. I feel like, you know, we are extending a, a fair amount of grace um, with these sessions, um, creamy and virtually. So I just, you know, would have um, sort of at the beginning of this done a little bit of an introduction and gotten out of guys' way. Um, I just, I want to let y'all get back to it because this is really riveting. Um, but I will just say, um, patience um, came in as someone I deeply admire um, her, I mean, her patient work is next level and I'm so in, like, enthralled that she's um, cooking us um, savory dishes. But um, this session in particular, I mean, uh, you guys got to meet Zoe um, to, to her presentation next, but got to meet Zoe yesterday, eat her food, read her cookbook, um, you know, sort of guided sign. But her presentation yesterday with Nana was so um, amazing because it was so much about, um, it's the, the heart of her work. And so to pair um, the Zoe with um, Chef Patient is really, I, just, I was really hopeful for this session um, to give y'all a sense of the work that these folks do in creating a home through food um, outside of context, right? So I feel like this session, these sessions in general, our representation panelist-wise 
Um, he's been really great at, um, um, around Ghana. I feel like he has such amazing um, presenters who, who reference Ghana really beautifully. And so um, I'll sort of shut up in a minute, but I just wanted to um, just say that I hope that we get the chance to hear from our chef patients and, and, and Zoe in particular about um, just the ways in which they think we can use these flavors and sort of um, the work they do to um, to give y'all a feel and the taste, the kind of kinetic connection to their home, their homeland. So I'll shut up and let y'all keep cooking because this is looking delicious. Well, cool. Thanks, Teresa. Again, I apologize. I didn't realize you were there earlier. We'll let you uh, kind of kicked it off. So uh, just kind of, kind of picking up where we where we've gotten to. So uh, again, with regards to the. Uh, with the eggplant dish, we have our pork. It's kind of steaming inside there. Both the chicken and the pork were, were, were thoroughly, uh, thoroughly seasoned and have had a chance to kind of sit on some of that seasoning. We really just used a mixture of, of uh, salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, uh, a little bit of ground up uh, Maggie cube, and, uh, and uh, a little bit of, of negro pepper. And I know Zoe's going to talk a little bit more about some of the seasonings and spices, so I'll, I'll kind of leave that for her to kind of get into some of the spices of the region. But you know that's one of the one of the important steps of 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 this cooking process is to make sure that the food is is very very well seasoned uh, and even has a chance to sit and, for lack of a better term, cure a little bit over the course of a couple of days. It's not the right the word to use, but it's the word that's kind of coming to my mind right now. Um, you know, and that's where a lot of the flavor really really comes from is that is that deep marination. So over here in the uh, in the chicken pot now we've uh, we've browned our chicken a little bit. We've added in our aromatics, and we'll go ahead and let those go. And then in just a few moments, we'll go ahead and add the spinach. Uh, we'll put the chicken back in, and everything gets a chance to cook down. So really here, it's, it's, it's pretty much just a traditional, uh, it's a traditional braising process, right? We, we develop flavor. Uh, we add our aromatics. Uh, we'll add our uh, other ingredients here. And in this case, the, uh, the spinach is going to almost act as our liquid. So as the spinach gives off, some of its own juices, that's going to be our braising liquid. Are we adding a little chicken stock to that? I forget. No, we're not no, going to add no any chicken, chicken stock to that. Okay, yeah. yeah, so it's just going to be the liquid coming off the spinach that's going to give us the juices that's going to really be our braising liquid, uh, and then that cooks down really, really well. Um, typically, we would use even a little bit more oil inside there, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we would have this really nice, rich green oil that we can kind of skim off the top and use that for other things. So in goes, uh, in goes a little bit more of that, of that oil right here. Okay. And this is the soy high oleic oil that we are using. I like it because it's absolutely flavorless. And that means it doesn't add any kind of extra flavor. So you're really getting the natural flavors of the food, so which is perfect. So and, and therein, again, lies uh, how we, we've been able to actually adjust this and contemporize this. So, so normally, uh, back home, we would be using some palm oil or some coconut oil or some other very highly saturated fat oils for this. Uh, the, the benefit to the high like soybean oil, obviously, is it's got those, uh, the high amount of those longer chains. It's a little bit more of a healthy oil. Uh, and it kind of compares to uh, olive oil or some of those other uh, better oils. But the challenge with those oils is they come with a flavor price. And, and more often than not, that flavor is, is nice when you have a little olive oil on your Italian cured meats or things like that. But uh, not a lot of olives in West Africa. So we really don't want the flavor of olive oil going inside here. So the ability to use the high lake soybean oil uh, and get a really good healthy fat inside there uh, without having the addition of flavor is, is a bonus for us. Um, similarly, the, uh, the eggplant dish that we're going to take a look at uh, in, in just another moment uh, is another one that is uh, it's prepared a little bit differently. Again, whereas all the ingredients are steamed uh, or sweated together, uh, and then in goes some chicken stock and in goes the eggplant. Uh, and this is a dish that's oftentimes finished with a little bit of palm oil at the end. And again, it all has a chance to simmer together and emulsify and capture those wonderful flavors. Uh, today, we decided not to use palm oil. We actually took some of the high lake soybean oil and we steeped it in some achote paste. So we warmed up the oil with the achote paste inside there, let it uh, come up to a really nice orange color, not quite as deep red as the, uh, as the palm oil would be, but certainly we've got the idea going of a nice red rich oil. Uh, and the achote actually does give it a really nice little uh, additional flavor inside there too. So again, some looking at some different ways we can take the uh, approach, take the technique, 
change it a little bit and turn it into something that we, that we want. Um, the pork dish here uh, is really, it's based on this uh, concept of what we call the, the bitter ball or the bitter eggplant. It's, uh, it's called tobogi in the, in the native language. Um, and uh, here we see a, a couple of different things going on. First of all, uh, it's all about preservation back home. Uh, yesterday when we did our demo, we talked a little bit about the dried fish uh, and how there's an abundance of seafood uh, on the coastline, but not really a lot of the means to preserve that. Again, refrigerators, freezers, things of that nature are, are not a very common thing to have. So things need to be smoked, things need to be dried, things need to be preserved. In the case of the eggplants, um, if we were back home, we would go out and we would actually just pick them right off the tree or off the, off the bush, and we would go ahead and cook them up, and, and uh, they would be ready to go. Uh, but, of course, you know, we can't use all of that what we produce, so we pick them and then we can a bunch of them, uh, and they put, get put into a brine, and that's how we can actually get them here in, here in the States. Uh, so um, they're a little bit bitter because they're picked immature. So again, they're little tiny white eggplants. They look like eggs, and sometimes it's also referred to as garden eggs. Uh, for today, down here, uh, we do have a, a can of those eggplants, and we're going to go ahead and pop them into the stew in, in just a few moments, or maybe right now. Mm -hmm. uh, when we head upstairs to the marketplace this afternoon, this is the dish that we'll be sampling in the marketplace this afternoon, and we actually used some of these eggplants, but we also put in a few Japanese eggplants as well. Uh, and we did that uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we wanted to kind of soften out the bitterness of these eggplants. Uh, we also, uh, frankly, we didn't have enough. Uh, so I had ordered up a dozen cans from, uh, from a supplier. This is one of those things that I couldn't even get from Amazon. Uh, I had to, to hit somebody on Etsy in order to get this. So we had ordered up a dozen cans. They sent 10. Uh, so, you know, once again, what do you do is we do what chefs do, is we make it work. So uh, we had uh, a little bit of Japanese eggplant in the house, and we went ahead and we used those. And, uh, and that'll cut the bitterness a little bit. It'll extend the dish a little bit. It'll contemporize it a little bit by adding a different nuance of eggplant, a different nuance of eggplant texture and eggplant flavor. Uh, and again, I guarantee it's going to be something that's uh, going to be really, really delicious. So I think what we're going to do now is we're going to let these guys uh, do what they need to do here. The spinach needs to cook down uh, for way much longer time than we have, uh, as does the pork. But uh, we're going to pass it off to Zoe now, and then uh, when she's done, we'll come back, and we do have, through the magic of television, a couple of finished dishes over here that we'll go ahead and plate up so that you can see the end of it. So Zoe, go ahead, take it away. Thank you. Not getting anywhere near as detailed as that. Um, I'm the founder of Zoe's Brown Kitchen, which is a brand which has been celebrating the flavors of West Africa for the last 13 years. And my demonstration is a dish that has, um, you know, it's okra fried, okra tempura, which obviously isn't anything that people in Ghana are consuming as a traditional dish. It's really not. Uh, the point here is to, to use the okra, which is an ingredient from Ghana, as a vehicle for other flavors from the but also, um, when I started my business in 2010 in the UK, I had a lot of work to do in explaining to people, you know, what, there was just so much to do. Because <laughs> um, food from the region was very, you know, it wasn't known outside of the communities where we cooked it, right? So at home or in parts of um, London where you have a high density population of Afro-Caribbean -Car people, outside of that, nobody knew what was going on. And I was trying to have a bigger, broader conversation with a larger audience. Anyway, now, for a lot of people have a, a sticky relationship with okra, literally, if you see the pun, you see the pun, you don't even know it's going to be pun. A uh, sticky relationship with okra, and the reason for why is, it's the mucilage from the side of the fruit. So when you cut okra in half, you can see these pods, and in those pods, they carry a mucus, which is actually incredibly good for you and is loaded with antioxidants. Now, in Ghana, traditionally, we like to, we make dishes like okra soup, right? And so okra as a, as a fruit normally goes into things chopped up very refined. The more you chop up the okra, the more you break open the pods. And the more you break open the pods, the more of that sticky, I like to call it, I'm rebranding it okra aloe. <laughs> because the aloe is so good for you, somebody should be bottling it. But anyway, 
Fat, sticky viscosity is not a texture that everybody enjoys or likes, including me, honestly. <laughs> so I wanted to find a way, but I knew how good okra was for people, right? And it's obviously from my place, so I wanted to celebrate okra. So making okra fries was like this, I guess, um, Trojan way to introduce people and recontextualize okra as an ingredient. So there you go. So it's not a very, you know, it's not very high level thinking going on. It's like, how do I make people eat okra? People like fries, they like fried things. People love tempura. So then we make okra tempura. So what's going on in okra tempura is some essential flavors in my, my dining pantry, right? So we've got alligator pepper here, which is this beautiful, also known as grains of paradise, which you probably more commonly know it here. It's used in Japan for things like gin, which is this most popular kind of utilization in the West at the moment. However, it is a very, very gorgeous peppercorn um, that has lots of brightness to it. It's like one of those uh, spices that really keeps on expanding. So you bite into it and it's going to be very, very like pepper forward, if you like, but then behind it you have viridity, you have even notes of strawberry some people call out, um, you have kind of very gentle menthol. Anyway, it's a very you know, giving peppercorn. So it's my everyday peppercorn instead of horse ground like pepper. So we can use that in here. So I'm not going to bother cutting it because it's just okra, okay? You don't have to cut okra. Just take the pith off and cut it down in the middle. And then you add your grains of paradise. You're going to add some ginger. Now, ginger features is probably, if you have a cookbook, ginger is probably in every single recipe because we use it so much in Ghana. Um, garlic. You know, obviously garlic isn't indigenous, but we do use it. Um, in Ghana, lots of our dishes. So we've got some garlic in there to, to broaden out the profile. Obviously, you have to have some heat. So we've got chili flakes, just a bit of zest to like punch above all of those different notes. And um, a little bit of salt, obviously, for seasoning and taste. Then you have, just mix it all together with a little bit of oil. You can use this lovely neutral soybean oil, or you can use groundnut oil, or any kind of oil you like, honestly. Right, then the tempura. I've got to say, the way this session started was very wild west. And this morning, my anxiety levels were through the roof. <laughs> I don't know why, because it's such a simple thing. But um, this chef right here, she really like helps me center and calm me down, which is why I'm able to speak. Anyway, I'm going to share it with you. Simple batter, again, like one of the things about my concept in London was, you know, I was cooking, I was trying to challenge people's perceptions around what Ghanaian food could be and how, what are the new ways we can celebrate ingredients. Um, and one of the vehicles, and you know, my mission was to bring it to the masses outside of Africa, right? And so, I was naive. <laughs> and so I was trying to do this in as many ways as possible, exhausting myself, but some of the ways included having a supper cup. Uh, doing street food, yada, yada, yada. So when I first started street food, I was very much um, doing, you know, I was doing king king fish, oh, wow. I was doing groundnut, and I was cooking obviously all from scratch and wood. That's a long time. Um, and people loved the food, but it was, as I said, it was 2010, so there was so much way to go in terms of competing with the fried chicken store and the burger company and blah, 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 who were all opening up with frozen food and like raking it in and I was like working for days and getting like very, you know, loyal but small following. So again, it was like, how do I bring people here? How do I get them to come? And it was things like making plantain fries, making okra fries, because when people see fries, they're like, oh, that's going to be some kind of a chip and then they came over, but I would have jollof then, then I would have red bread and then I would, yeah. once I had them in front of me, I could explain to them all these other things. So it was like things to draw them. Mm. Anyway, just a simple you know, tempura batter, but I'm using calabash nutmeg, which is this gorgeous, uh, relational, obviously, nutmeg, but it's so powerful, intense, and mm. it's just wonderful. Again, a bit of salt to season, and some very, very ground grains of paradise. And some sparkling water just to tempura to aerate that butter. Can she do it? Yes, she can. <laughs> mm. Anyway, back to opera. 
Okay, sorry. Um, where was I talking about that? Yeah, so you know, using these different ways and means to draw people in, like putting my jollof spice mix onto my chicken and then making a jollof fried chicken, you know, because people know it's fried chicken. So there's lots and lots of tricks like that, really, just to get people in to enable them to see what else was going on, you know, it's like a trick. Oh, so there. Okay, I'm not going to use up my elbow grease too much because this will. Ta da! <laughs> Just have to be able to make a little bit. I'm grateful. Right, so, I'm going to put the glove on. Now, to go with this, the other thing was, you know, shito. Shito is a very traditional hot pepper condiment. <coughs> Very powerful. I remember being very, very, I think it was like six or seven the first time I smelt the out of the jar. Yeah. And my mind was all, all in all kinds of places, you know. It's such an intense, there's the smokiness, there's the crayfish, the fermentedness, mm -hmm. the oil, uh, the different kinds of chilies going on. It was very, very, you know, because sometimes in my house we have peanut butter for dinner, another night we have fish and chips, all kinds of things would go on. And when my dad was around, we'd have and tilapia, yeah. the yeah. red fishes, the shito. And the shito. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, I wanted to, on the street food side of things, I wanted to bring shito into the equation. Just go up. And um, this was always tricky at street food. You know, in street food, you've got to feed like 5,000 people mm. in like two hours. <laughs> no. I have to really get this method down, so it's a bit chipping. <laughs> anyway, the, it became a very, very popular street food and it ended up going on my menu in my spread store. Oh, fabulous. Anyway, back to Shito. So Shito is this gorgeous, unctuous, kind of like a Ghana XO almost. Mm -hmm. like I use it on a cheese board. Yeah. But normally, this comes straight up nice and hot like this. And I wanted to make um, a condiment that people recognise without me having to do too much work. So I just added the shito to a basic aioli or a basic mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. Again, the soybean oil works here because it's neutral. You've got lots of chili oil coming in already, so you don't want to... I saw uh, Nana Wilmot makes a gorgeous aioli with um, palm oil. Palm oil aioli. Mm -hmm. And this is a very simple, similar kind of principle. It's like sneaking in most of the different flavors mm -hmm. in ways that will make people comfortable to try it. And how it, it ends up being... I've got a bunch of soapy names for this. First of all, it was uh, crayonnaise because of the crayfish. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> then it was um, Chito Mayo. But I had a, a girl working for me who was Spanish. Okay. And at festivals, there would be very many queues of people, and she would be going, Shita Mayo, Shita Mayo, Shita Mayo. <laughs> it sounded like she was saying Shitty Mayo. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to stop that. So, I mean, crayonnaise works, but also, you know, a Shita Aioli, because that's what it is, right? It depends yeah. what, what environment you're in, really, of how you want to call that. But all that's to say, it's like simple. It's like, okay. Here's an ingredient that everybody in England apparently said they hated, and then suddenly you reframe it like this, and you know you become the, a very famous street food <laughs> outfit <laughs> yeah. for having done something like that. The next thing you know, other companies are putting aqua fries on their menu. So, and that was all because we were trying to sneak in a couple of ingredients from Ghana. I guess the point of what I'm saying is <laughs> there's an opportunity at all times to to celebrate the ingredients um, in different contexts, in different environments, and for it not to, to lessen anything about what Ghanaian cuisine is or what the culture is, but to introduce more and more people to elements of it to spark their own curiosity so they will you know, want to go and find out more, basically. And that was really the whole point of my brand. Once you've got a nice colour on it, Chefy Chef here is doing it, doing the work, um, you're done. And then, obviously, we're going to finish with some of my delightful okra salts, which was an accident. I'm just going to own up and fess up about that right now. Fabulous. 
Again, it was about okra, though, because okra is just an crazy, incredible vegetable. I don't know if you know things, but you know, there's people doing research around the fibers of okra and how that can be used to manufacture trainers and even housing materials and things like that. Okra overnight releases a perfume. Did you know that? I oh, know. People are bottling that perfume right now to sell okra perfume. There is um, all kinds of wonderful medicinal things coming out of okra because of the the type of sucrose it produces, it's very, very good um, for people with diabetes. So you can have like a, a, su um, a sucrose replacement from the type of glucose it releases. Anyway, the things we're learning about okra are never ending. <laughs> um, and its capacity, you know, there's a capacity there to change the world, not just from a food perspective, but in terms of using the food as a material. I think I talked a little bit the other day about you know, all the ways you can use the skin of a plantain when you roast it. Anyway, this is it. You've got a shito mayo, a crayonnaise, shiti mayo, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and you've got um, okra fries. And I've got to tell you guys, this is one of the most popular things I ever put on a menu at any time, anywhere. And it's really simple. And it's really delicious. And it has changed many, many minds about opera. I hope it will change yours too. There you go, I'm done. Wonderful. Good job. Wow. Thank you. Take me some of that. I want to try that. Yeah, looking forward Fabulous. to tasting that in Thank a couple of sir. minutes. But I think, I think the, the most profound thing that you just said was you want to change people's minds, Mind. put it on a French fry uh, or, or some, kind of, some yep. kind of fry. So uh, we've got to come back over here to where we are and you can see that we're, we're progressing along. Uh, again, we need more hours than we have to spare up here. So we did uh, actually go ahead and prepare some in advance. So over here in, uh, in this pot here, and we can maybe do a little, little pot switch here. You want to yeah. heat them up a little bit first? Or mm -hmm. how about we do this? Why don't we take uh, that one and pull it forward? Yep. So this is the, uh, the chicken green stew from yesterday uh, that you saw down in the marketplace. And that's pretty much all ready to go. We're going to get it a little bit warmer here. And then we'll go ahead and plate that up. But we also have the eggplant stew over here. Uh, and again, this is what we'll be serving in the marketplace today. And this one just needs to be finished off with a little bit of the, uh, of the oil. Uh, again, normally we'll be using some palm oil here, but today we've got some achote infused hyalic soybean oil. Uh, and that's what we'll be kind of finishing this off with. Um, and this one is, uh, is supposed to be a little, a little fatty. And remember that, that fat is flavor. Uh, fat is texture, fat is good. You know, we shouldn't be trying to eliminate fat from our diet but we should be choosing some of the better fats for us, the healthier fats for us, uh, because those are the things that we really, uh, we really need to have. Uh, so with that, I think so we're, we're just about ready to go over here. So I think what we'll do now is, uh, I'm gonna grab, step in front of you for a moment, I'm gonna grab this pot here. Yep, and this of course is also one of the most important foodstuffs in, uh, in Africa, and that is rice. And, and certainly the, uh, the jollof is one of my favorite dishes as well that they make, but we have to acknowledge that more often than not, what you're gonna see is just a plain steamed white rice because the flavor all comes from the stew itself. Uh, when we make rice at home, uh, we may put a whole uh, uh, pepper, uh, a whole scotch bonnet pepper or two in the rice pot. Uh, don't smash it up, just kind of nestle them right there inside the rice grains. Uh, and as the rice is cooking, some of that flavor will come off of it. You know, we don't think of scotch bonnet peppers as having a lot of flavor, but certainly it is there. Uh, and if you smash the pepper, then you'll get the heat. But if you're careful with the pepper, then you'll just get a really nice little bit of, of flavor inside there. One of the things, you know, I usually get a little uptight about is when people talk about, you know, good fats, bad fats. And one of the things I tell my students is try to eat as natural as possible. You know, I said this to someone last night, we were talking about oils, palm oil, coconut oil, and so forth. And we Africans have been eating these things for centuries. And if they are as bad as they're supposed to be, we will be extinct. And I know a lot of people that will be happy about that because they can take all our natural resources. So <laughs> we're still alive. Everything has to be done in moderation. You know, you don't want to drink a gallon of palm oil or coconut oil, but we've been cooking with it, you know, before 
I was even conceived. So I think like everything, just like butter and all these other things, I think are a lot better for you than things that are manufactured and so forth. Always try to eat as clean as possible, but everything has to be done in moderation. Pam will actually, if I may add, yes. I was talking about this yesterday, okay. actually contains quite a lot of antioxidants Oxidants, and a yes. lot of things that um, are very, very good for you. Mm -hmm. And it has an incredibly singular flavour profile that yes. you cannot replace. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when I wrote my book, I, there were some recipes where I tried to swap out palm oil for other things, but mm -hmm. I did have a conversation at the beginning saying mm -hmm. it's really unfortunate that the perspective in the world is that palm yes. oil is bad for you. Exactly. But it's not, you know, mm -hmm. it has been farmed poorly in certain regions, mm -hmm. but it's been vil vil vilified in a way, yes. unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. And it's a great oil, good for you. And yeah, you're right, everything yes. in moderation. Everything in moderation, guys. All right, so there we have it. So we have our two dishes uh, now done. We have our, our tobogi, our African bitter eggplant stew. Uh, and then we have our chicken with potato greens, uh, which is really spinach, uh, but we won't tell anybody. Uh, and, and again, we've, we've made some modifications based on, on where we are and based on how we're, we're trying to change uh, some eating habits. But I guarantee you that they'll both be delicious. So uh, I think we all welcome any questions that you may have at this point. We've got a few minutes left in our session. Uh, so, so yeah, thanks. I would love, uh, I'm, this is, you know, it's so good, this is so dope. Um, I, before we go to the audience, I really want to jump in real quick. Um, I think the last session, um, Selassie invited us to really think a lot about um, engaging with folks who are bringing ingredients directly to consumers from uh, producers on the continent. And I would love if Zoe could talk a little bit more. I feel like she said she sort of... Impl um, implies like really sort of self-deprecating a little bit like her um, spice company is like a fluke and I think they're so beautiful and so delicious and so much intention um, in the way she built her brand. I would love if she could talk a little bit more about her company because I think to Slash's point, um, engaging with companies like hers are ways in which we could be more um, better stewards and better um, engage with um, countries like Ghana and flavors. Um, like the ones you all have beautifully shared with us. Thank you, Therese. I think I caught the question. <laughs> it's not very good. I, just want you, I want you to just geek, geek out and talk about your I, company. I, I, and I won't talk about Tell you. people okay. where they can get your spices. And oh, I know. So Because yeah. the intention that you're using um, with reference to um, sourcing, and you talked a little bit about it um, yesterday with Nana, but I just want to make sure we don't leave this place without people really understanding <laughs> and knowing about your company. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so... I have an online, well, my brand does many things. Zoe's Ghana a Kitchen, it's a cookbook, it's the e-commerce shop at the moment. Um, and it has, you know, I, just Google it, <laughs> it's fine. But the point is, <laughs> um, what was my intention behind the spice shop? Now, you know, in 2010, like I said, I've had quite a long career in specifically talking about Ghanaian ingredients uh, through my lens of identity. And I spent a lot of time celebrating these ingredients and encouraging people to work with them and use them, very naively believing that that would mean the financial benefit of that would go back to West Africa because people would have to purchase the ingredients from those producers. Um, so I was like floating around in naive land for a while. And then my book came out and there was this pressure for me to not, in 2017, I talked about this yesterday a little bit as well, but pressure not to include single origins that I wanted to because of uh, accessibility and then, you know, people wouldn't be able to feel like they could cook from it if they couldn't get those things. Anyway, fast forward, in 2018, I was then in Ghana, in Accra, I was talking to Chef Binta, Chef Selassie also at the time, actually, and then I, the problem was I was trying to source uh, grains of paradise, I was also trying to source millet and things in, in Nima market and I couldn't find it in any of the markets. And the chefs told me that, you know, it's becoming a big problem. A, you know, big, uh, white, I don't know why, they are white, that's not air quotes. <laughs> 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 it's white, sorry guys. Um, you know, big white food companies were coming in and buying up all the land and the crops, outpricing local producers, so it was very difficult now to source it locally. People couldn't even afford their own spices anymore. And the dual thing going on at the same time was that 
you know, the, the, the lens um, towards what was valuable had shifted away from our own food in, in, on the ground. And people, because so much new investment was coming in, so much Western influence was coming in, you know, people were now looking at Japanese food and the French food and the classic ideas of what is valuable. So there was also, you know, this kind of uh, dissolution of the relationship and the cooking and the traditional side of things. So all the, this all created new questions in my head, different questions from 2010 when the question was, you know, why don't people know about this food, da, da, da. And now the question is, why aren't Africans getting paid? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and so this started me thinking about decolonizing the food industry, and this made me want to have a short supply chain with my producers so that I could be inherently aware of what was going on in the value chain and know that they were getting paid properly and actually earning, but also to close the gap between the consumer and the product, or you know, whether it was through my cookbook or somebody else's cookbook, that they would be able to get hold of some of the ingredients easily uh, in a way that was you know, sustainably sourced, fairly priced, um, but packaged beautifully in a way with, you know, with a brand that is giving value to those ingredients um, in how we talk about it, how we treat them, and how we use them. And um, please visit zoesgarnerkitchen.com and go and you know, buy some of the spices, like Grains of Paradise we talked today, the Okra Salt I made today, um, Grains of Salem, Cuba, the, the Sorrel Salt, oh, like, the I'm sorrel salt, salt, just My good. Sia blend, good. my Keloeli blend, the Jollof blend, you know, it's like, it's really just about, the conversation for me has moved away from, you know, everybody needs to try this, but when you're doing it, please buy responsibly and try and buy from black producers, and definitely buy from black African producers specifically, because, you know, there's an opportunity here where, <clears throat> I'm just going to say it, <laughs> that, you know, Africa has finally risen to a place, uh, the foods from Africa, the cuisines from the 54 countries are finally, right, having this wonderful moment in time where there's an appreciation for them. And there's also an appreciation for the nuances within all of those different cuisines. Um, and the danger is, right now, is not to celebrate all of that nuance and f variance and exciting things that lots of people don't know about in favor of kind of co-opting it and, you know, disenfranchising Africans from having their moment, essentially, and monetizing, finally, um, for themselves, their own culture and their own gifts to the world. So just be mindful. That's the, that's the point, really. Be mindful when you're making your purchasing decisions. And when you're cooking, be mindful. You know, I also have a, you know, um, an interracial marriage. My mm -hmm. wife, Sarah, couldn't be here, sadly, and she would have kept me straight this morning. <laughs> um, but I love that. I love that you're able to bring each other's um, experiences and talents together so that you can share the story together, you know? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's it. That's what I've got on that. I hope that answers the question. No, perfect. Thank you so much. Very well done, David. If anybody else has any other questions, we'd be happy to, to, to entertain them. Hi. Okay, so I was curious yesterday, because I know in America, Sophia was talking about cooking with okra. Like, I thought okra always had that sort of uh, mucilaginous quality to it, but then she was saying the ones that we had yesterday didn't. So is it because it's... It's the preparation. Older, or... No, so... types also. And then if you this, don't like that characteristic, what, do you, what should you not do? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's like, there's probably about 250 at least varieties of okra, and mm -hmm. they all have different inherent qualities. Mm -hmm. I mean, they all look like okra, but they're going to get long ones, short ones, fat ones, skinny ones. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, long, the longer the okra is, the more fibrous it is. Mm -hmm. um, to cook, I, my, my opinion is I don't want to cook with very fibrous okra because... Um, it's not very nice to chew. Also, it will lose some of the sweetness because, you know, it's just been on the vine a bit too long. However, that's great for, you know, if you wanted to harvest fibers, then to do things with, you can weave. Honestly, there's a whole practice around weaving okra fiber and making things out of it. It's crazy. It's wonderful. There's that. And then, you know, like I said, the, the shorter, fatter, squatter ones tend to, in my experience, come from uh, India and Mexico, they tend to have a lot more flavor. Um, 
Anyway, so the point is the mucilage in the middle, those pods are where the mucilage resides, where the mucilage resides, where the mucilage resides. Um, so the more you mess up the pods, the more mucilage you get. Now, there's ways to do that. You can chop it up really, really fine, which is what we do in making opera soup, and that's going to open it up. And then you can do an, a second step, and the third step, which people do, is to boil that, boiled okra, because it's going to enhance um, and make it even more and more sticky. Mm. So the answer is, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and one which is why I do one cut. This is one cut down the middle in a way that doesn't break open the pods. And you, and you can eat that raw, and it's a delicious crudite. You know, it's like, mm, 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 without any of the stickiness. But if you want the stickiness, you've just got to chop it up or you know, apply heat to it so the mucilage will break open. And one of the things... Stop, stop saying mucilage, it's aloe. aloe. Okra aloe. Okay. And one of the things, too, to decrease that okra aloe, make sure you wash your okra before you cut into it, because if you, get, if you cut the okra and then put water into it, it expands the mucus cells and it releases more mucus. Aloe. Or aloe. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to bottle that shit. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not, I, we don't have a clock running, but I think just, just by what I can see, we probably have time for, for one more question, if there's one more question out there. Otherwise, we're happy to kind of give you a few minutes back. I know we have the discovery, flavor discovery uh, uh, session is next right outside. So, uh, so thank you. Oh, Mark. Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't even see you up there. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm Okay. Well, I have a question about bongo. Uh-huh. So, Zoe, that's you. Can you hear me at all? No, I can't. No, go, uh, yes, kind of. Let's just do it. I yell a little louder. How about that? That's good. All right, so palm oil is not used in America very often, right? Correct. Could you give us uh, just a quick breakdown of like the qualities of the flavor profile and how it's used? So, so again, question is, is uh, if we can share a quick breakdown of the qualities of palm oil and, uh, and how it's That's used. Go. Tag team. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so palm oil comes from palm nut fruit, which is like this beautiful little orange, red, very gorgeous to look at uh, fruit. Is it a fruit or is it a nut? It is a nut. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a nut, palm nut. Anyway, mm -hmm. and what the, the traditional process to create the oil from that is you just bash it and bash it and bash it, and it's going to release oil. It's the same way if you press avocado, it's going to release oil. So, I mean, there are processes then, some people bleach palm oil to make it refined or unrefined. Mm -hmm. Personally, I prefer like zoomy, unrefined, heavy, heavy, earthy palm oil because that's really what I'm going for is that flavor. So the flavor of, and it is very hard to describe the flavor of palm oil because it's so unique, but mm -hmm. I'm, I wish I'd attempt it. Yeah. It's giving earth, okay? It's giving deep, but sort of warm nuttiness. Mm -hmm. As if, mm -hmm. as if some nuts have like been roasted. Butternut squash, roasted butternut squash. Mm. You know, the palm soup also. You, palm butter, you know, we make a variety of things out of it. So in order to make the palm oil, you usually take the nut, pound it, and it has like a husk kind of looking texture to it. And you soak that in water, and then you squeeze the husk out, and then we eat the whole thing. So we will make a palm nut soup, which is called palm butter. And usually when you cook the palm butter, you get the oil off the top. And then also there's a seed, there's a nut in the palm kernel. And we usually crush that, and then we make oil out of that as well. So every bit and pieces of the palm nut is always used to, you know, evaporate incorporate in our diet and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. Sis. You're welcome. And then, now the reason, so, and then, so that beautiful red, luxurious, gorgeous oil, palm nut soup, soup. okra soup, mm -hmm. um, so many soups, mm -hmm. and, you know, red, red, but frying plantain in it. It's a very, very gorgeous oil with a distinctive flavor. Yeah. And it has had a bad reputation in the last 15 or so years because of the deforestation that's been going on and the harvesting of that um, product, but not for palm oil that we use, mm -hmm. red palm oil, but yeah. for that tiny bit of kernel that you're talking about right, right in yeah. the middle, mm -hmm. which is extrapolated into many, many hundreds and thousands of, literally thousands of products, like 
chocolate bars, toilet, yeah, it pops up in toiletries. And, yeah. So the Unilevers and the Monsantos of the world have been irresponsibly farming it for that particular little part, which has caused people to then criticize red palm oil because of that sustainability, sustainability issue. But inherently, we, know, we have farmed organically for mm -hmm. thousands of years. Yeah. With mm -hmm. Very obviously, Africans are spiritually connected to the land. Like, so all of those processes have come with the West and have, you know, again, it's that thing of the West and in this industrialization of food mm -hmm. disrupting our own food system and our own <laughs> natural yeah. ecosystems system. and then telling us that we, we can't yeah. use what we've been using for thousands centuries. of years exactly. um, because yeah. they fucked it up. Yeah. <laughs> That's not cool. Yeah, that so... You know, there's nothing wrong with red palm oil if you're buying it responsibly, if you're farming it responsibly. And as I've said before, it has wonderful, wonderful health benefits. And people, yeah. you know, there are brands out there. I said again, I'm not yeah. going to promote them because they're white brands. When there's a black brand that's doing a, a label that says sustainable on it. But, you know, Ghana's finest, Africa's finest, all of your generic mm -hmm. family, auntie stores, yeah. mm -hmm. stock Zumi or palm oil from yeah. West mm -hmm. Africa. Huh. One of the things, trends are great, you know, I've been living in the West for more than, oh my goodness, I'm dating myself for more than 45 years. I'm dating you know. myself as well, it feels wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in England, you know, grew, I was born in Africa, lived in Liberia until I was nine, then I moved to England, lived in England until I was 18, I came here. So I've been living in the West for a very long time, and I've always been very conscious about all the different trends. One of the things, you know, we Africans, we have this, this is what we do, and, you know, we know more about the human body than, you know, you guys are just starting to learn these things. And what I've found, a lot of times these trends start, and 10, 20 years down the road, it's like, oh, no, we pluck in this, this is no longer good for you. And, you know, so, and for me, these type of things are dangerous, because you have people get these ideas that this is not good for them, and they start eating something else, and then down the line you find out, oh, these things are causing cancer, these things are causing diabetes, these things are causing liver problems. And you know, then they have to switch back to what they were originally doing. And you know, we as food, you know, foodies and you know, promoters of food, we need to be conscious of these things because a lot of these products and a lot of these things that we're having people switch to is actually bad for them mm -hmm. and, and, and for us. I mean, my children grew up eating African food and eating health. They'll go to their friends' homes and they will be like, what is that? We can't eat that. That's not food, you know? That's not, you know, somebody baked cookies with my daughter when she was three years old and my daughter is all excited, we're gonna make cookies, and they get a frozen box. My daughter's like, that's not cookies, <laughs> you know? So she's used to making cookies with sugar, butter, eggs, vanilla, but these people, what is in that packet? Mm -hmm. Anything that has to sit on the shelf for an extended amount of time, think about it. What is in it that's causing it to stay on that shelf? What is in it that's causing it to stay in that freezer? Okay, these are the things that you need to think about, and these are the things that are harming our bodies. Yes, ma'am. Amen. So and if I, I may, I, I'm just going to add to that. Sorry, just very just I'll be watch, very watch the time is all we, we're at. Um, and this is why I'm encouraging people again. You know, the thing with the spice shop and to talk about ancestral ingredients is because, especially for the people of the African diaspora, mm -hmm. we have to remember our lineage and mm -hmm. where we came from and what they ate and how they survived. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk enough about, you know, the myriads of health benefits from our diets, our cuisines, mm -hmm. our spices, our fruits, our plants. Um, and there are so, so many. Mm -hmm. And we do need to start connecting people back with their roots in terms of what to eat mm -hmm. because this is why the diaspora has so many issues health-wise mm -hmm. in the West because we're not meant for that diet. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I stop. Sorry. Well, again, thank you for thank that. You. Thank you, everybody. It's 1033. I think we can move on to our next one. Big thank you to, uh, to the United Soybean Board for sponsoring our session. Uh, thanks, Zoe. Thanks, Patience. Great job today. And we'll see you uh, up in the marketplace, I guess. Yeah. Well done, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you should talk thank more. You. You're really good at that. Oh, my God. Darling? so nervous. Yes, darling. Yes.
Charleston, South Carolina at Ronnie Scouts Barbecue, and I'm the pit master. This is really just the basics. It's really about time and temperature back here. I started off working in the kitchen for about two years. I always like every time we get a break out front or something, I'll sneak back here and do what I can just to learn. I mean, by the time it was ready for me to come back here, I basically knew it already. Right here, our fire box. We have someone come in five o'clock every morning, start our fire. Once we get that hard enough, we'll take our shovel, just break everything apart. Uh, we use oak wood mainly. We we'll just evenly shovel it under the food. Everything cooks at the same time. It's flipped at the same time. Comes off at the same time. Uh, we have some ribs on this pit right now. I had these on for about one and a half hour. I got our bones here. Once we see those start to rise, we know the ribs are ready to be mopped and flipped. We'll check for color first. Once the color is there, we'll take our sauce, mop the back side, flip them over, mop the front side. We have some hogs coming, some a little bigger, some smaller. I say they weigh about 150 to 175. I think they come down from, uh, what's it, North Carolina. So this is our hogs. Our hogs take about 12 to 15 hours to cook. Our shoulders here, see how tender it is? Just like that. We know it's done. I'm gonna make sure we open every part of the hog up. Is that for the seasoning to penetrate? Yes, ma'am. Also the rodney sauce. The way we sell it, we sell it whole. So we want shoulders, belly, everything inside of it. So we want to make sure everything has the flavor, everything is there. And is that the first time you'll be seasoning the hog or did you season it already throughout the cooking process? No, this is the first, first and only time. So not even salt and pepper before? Nothing. No, no. Just, just the hog. Just right? love and fire? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> So the way we mop through it, we're going to start on our legs first. Whichever corner we start off at, we want to make sure we always go towards the middle. We don't want to mop it, i say more than four times because it'll start picking up the seasoning. How many gallons of the uh, mop are you going through a day? <sighs> through a day, i say about six. We just shut the lid back down. So how long? Um, with, the, with the mop? About half an hour. Once we let uh, the runny sauce just boil in, let everything just soak in, what we'll do, we'll take it from off the pit, put it in this pan, and we'll pick the bones out, mix everything together, make sure they taste everything up there. How many hogs going through? Yeah, I say a regular day, we'll go through about two of them. Uh, slight chance, busy day. It'll be about three, and if we know we have like a bunch of catering or a holiday coming up, we'll do four hogs. Freshen up your barbecue menu and your ordinary slaw with this recipe for grilled peach and napa cabbage slaw, dressed with sadly spiced Aleppo pepper, almond and peach vinaigrette. Let me show you how easy it is to make. First, we'll preheat a grill on medium high. Combine the honey and oil in a bowl. Add the peaches and gently toss, season with salt. Grill the peaches on both sides until charred but still firm. Set aside. Place the cabbage, fennel, red peppers, kohlrabi, green onions, parsley and chives in a large bowl. Add the vinegar, smoked peach vinaigrette, salt and pepper. The smoked peach vinaigrette is made from real peaches puree and has a delicious full flavor. Finish the slow by gently mixing in the peaches and candied almonds. So here's our finished side salad. Grilled peach and napa cabbage slaw dressed with a sadly spiced Aleppo pepper, almond and peach vinaigrette. Delicious!